problems with it. So, well, good I'll, evening. I'll if I can. This is Helen Sanders here in Sebring, Florida. This is class two, and this is session one that we're starting tonight. And we are being equipped by the Lord, but let's go into a word of prayer first. Father, we just come to you tonight in the wonderful name of Jesus. We enter boldly before your throne of grace. We ask tonight, Lord, that this teaching would go into good ground, that all that we say and all that we do and all that we learn will enable and equip us to go forth and do the ministry that you've called each one of us to do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. The introduction tonight is on the Bible. And I could ask you how many books there are in the Bible, and let me get an answer. How many? 66. 66 books. The and first would, thing that we learn, and if you have questions, you can ask me at the end uh, after we're off live. But the first thing we're going to learn is knowing God's Word. Christians should know the Bible for many reasons. But the primary one is because God is its author. All Bible students know that God is creator. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. God is creator. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heaven and the earth. So he's creator. He's also not just creator, he's our redeemer. Let's turn to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. And one thing about this school, it isn't my opinion that counts. It's the word of God that we're studying because it says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So turn to Isaiah 60, and we will read verse 16. And it says, Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles, and shall suck the breast of kings, and thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. That's a great promise. Also, turn to Genesis 18.25. We're learning that he's creator, redeemer, in Genesis 18.25. In this, this verse, we're going to learn that he is also a judge. 18.25. Genesis 18.25 says, That be far from thee, to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So God's the judge of all the earth. Human writers feel it vital that we read their books, but it's much more important that we read God's book, the Bible. About 14 centuries before Christ, that's 1,400 years, our Bible had its beginnings in the Sinai Desert. In this arid place, God spoke to Moses, who had once been a prince in Egypt and was nearly 120 years old at the time when he spoke to him. And at the Lord's command, Moses picked up his pen and began writing scripture's first five books. It's called the Pentateuch, which means five. You've heard of the Pentagon, right? It's five sides to it. Well, the Pentateuch is the first five books, which are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch. More than 1,500 years later, the divine manuscript, we're speaking in the Bible now, was completed on a lonely windswept island in the Mediterranean Sea by a former fisherman, John the Apostle. From Genesis through Revelation, the final biblical book, there are 66 divinely inspired books. 
over the centuries, around 40 men and women representing varied backgrounds and writing styles. They served as channels for God's word. Yet in spite of these, in, in spite of these variations and time and talent, the completed work displays a marvelous history, theological, geographical, topical, and biographical unity. Let's say those again, they're historical, it's theological, that's the study of God. Geographical, it covers all kinds of areas. Topical, it covers all sorts of subjects. And biographical unity. The Bible's practical benefits for us may well be summarized under two headings. Knowing and growing. The Bible proclaims the good news of the gospel that we might know God. But it explains the will of God that all of us may grow spiritually before him. That's what it's all about. Studying the word is so that you can mature. Studying the word so you can grow. Scripture also reveals our place within God's program and it answers crucial questions pertaining to our origin, our purpose, and our destiny. Because God has revealed his unchanging truths, the Christian faith provides real answers and guidance to every generation. And I'm sure there's many that would say, in this area, area that we live in, this time period, Ah, the Bible's outdated. Ah, that's for way back and that's for old people. That's not true. It's for every generation. Although we cannot grasp how individual events fit into God's program, we can understand God's basic plan in order to come to know and serve him. Turn to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Chapter 11. And we will read verse 5. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 5. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones grow, do grow in the womb of her that's with child. Even so, thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. You see, we don't know everything. But I would say this, God is a know-it-all. We can understand God's basic plan for our lives, how to serve him, what he wants us to do by reading the word and studying it. Few joys can compare with realizing our places in God's program and working to fulfill our destinies. And I could ask you, have you ever wondered what your purpose was? Do you know your purpose? You can't know these things outside of the Word of God. God's Word will show us the path. In fact, it tells us in Psalm 119 that God's Word is a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. I want you to keep in mind tonight that the Bible is not a book of philosophy, although it's philosophical. Do not go to the Bible for scientific treatise. However, there's no discrepancy between ascertained facts of science and the Bible. The Bible is not a book of history, but it's found to be accurate when recording history. The Bible was given to man from God, revealing Jesus Christ. Even the book of Revelation, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about, revealing Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. It reveals him as the Son of God, but also God the Son. It reveals him as the only Savior. He's the center and he's the circumference. It's Christ from Genesis to Revelation. Turn to John chapter 14. 
John chapter 14. John chapter 14, and we'll read verse 6. He's the only Savior, it says. John 14, 6. Jesus said unto him, any time Jesus has something to say, I think we need to listen. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. That lets us know there's a Father. That lets us know there's a Son. But Jesus is the only way to the Father. Jesus and the Father are not the same person like some teachers, some cults teach. I have to just say what it is because Jesus is not the Father and he's not the Holy Spirit. There's three distinct individuals, but they're one in unity. Can I get an amen? amen. Turn to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. John chapter 5 and 39. And this is the will, this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Praise God. You've been given to Jesus by the Father. The Bible is as high above all other books as the heavens are above the earth. Someone has said of the Bible, read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be right. Let's say that one again. You might want to write it down. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, practice it to be right. Proverbs teaches about wisdom. Reading the word of God brings us great wisdom. And if we believe it, it says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's where we're safe. Then we have to take what we've learned and put it into practice to walk correctly. Just because you know it doesn't mean you're going to use it. The Bible claims to be the inspired word of God. Revelation may be defined as that process by which God imparted to man truths. Revelation reveals truths which he otherwise could not know. The details of creation, think about this, in Genesis 1 and 2 are an example of revelation. Since man was not created until which day? The sixth day. He could not possibly know the events that happened prior to that unless God gave it to someone. And he did. He gave it to Moses. When he was up in that mountain, God saw him face to face. He didn't just get the Ten Commandments, he talked to him and he penned it down. And by the way, Joshua was up there with him, in case you didn't know that. But revelation had to come from God because Moses wasn't there in the beginning. I wasn't there, you weren't there. We know God spoke to the human authors of our Bible but just how did he speak? Did he send him an email? <laughs> how about a text message? How about messenger? No, he didn't do any of them. Did he speak in Hebrew, Greek, angelic language? How did he speak to them? He spoke to them in their own language. Let me ask you a question. And people are talking about this and they're going back legalistic under the name of Yeshua. And Yeshua is the Hebrew name for Jesus. But if somebody came and started talking to you in Hebrew, and you didn't know Hebrew, how are you going to understand it? God's going to talk to you in your own language. 
He doesn't want you to not know what he has to say. So he speaks to you by your spirit in your own language. I've heard him say Helen before. He didn't say Helene, he didn't say Elena, he didn't say Alain like French. He said Helen. My sheep hear my voice and they follow. But you have to understand it. The Old Testament was Hebrew, Aramaic, and Koine Greek was in the New Testament. That's what they spoke then. But I don't know Hebrew. I know some words. I don't know Greek. So Jesus, that's what I call him, speaks to me in my language. And an angel can speak to you in your own language too. He spoke to them in their own language. I want us to turn to 1 Samuel and find out how he spoke to a young man. 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel comes right before 2 Samuel. <laughs> Wasn't that a smart thing we learned tonight? Now we're going to talk about a young man named Samuel. Samuel's mother's name was Hannah. And Hannah's husband had another wife that had children. And Hannah was barren. And Hannah wanted a child. And they went to the temple, and she was praying. And the priest there by the name of Eli, who had lost much of his sight, pretty much blind, but he was also spiritually blind, he thought she was drunk. See, if we don't stay close to God, we're going to drift away. And she said, I'm not drunk. I'm praying for a child. He said, oh, here, I'll pray. You can have a child next year. So she has this child named Samuel, and she made a vow to God if he gave her a child, she'd give him back to God. So she takes him down to Eli so that he could be trained and equipped. That's what the priests were supposed to do. That's what pastors are supposed to be doing now, and apostles, and prophets, and evangelists, hello, and teachers. But they're not doing the job because people are not understanding how to hear the voice of God. And I'll tell you how I know that. The Lord showed me a vision, and I saw these sheep. And off to the left, I saw Jesus standing there. Off to the right, I saw a man. It looked like a monk's coat with a big dark hood, and the face was dark. You couldn't tell it, but it was very dark. And these sheep are following that man in that coat that cloak and Jesus pointed to me and he says Helen my sheep are not hearing my voice and they're following after another voice and I'm telling you there's so much deception out there right now how do you know the voice of God by this this Bible people are going for prophetic words and I'm not against that because I give prophetic words too but if that's all you get you're going to not have what you need in time. You need to be equipped and trained so you know when God speaks, it's Him. I've had things said to me, and it sounded so close to God, but I realized it wasn't. That voice sounds so much. You have to be able to hear His voice and then distinguish it. So here's little Samuel. We're in chapter 3 of 1 Samuel, and we're going to read the story. And the child, that means he's really young. He was taken there as a, a baby, when you know, a little toddler. And the child Samuel, chapter 3 of 1 Samuel, ministered unto the Lord before Eli. What does minister mean? Does that mean you put on a long robe and, you're, and you stand in the pulpit? No, minister means servant. He served the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. God was silent. When there's sin in the camp, things are going to be silent. Verse 2, And it came to pass at that time, when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim, that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, you know, the menorah's in there, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down asleep. The priest's job were to take care of the things in the temple, and Eli was right there with him, supposedly being trained. Verse 4, The Lord called Samuel, and he answered, 
here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son, lie down again. You see, he had not been trained. Verse 7, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. You see, there had not been any training at all. This boy was there. He was trained to minister, probably did all the dirty work, but he wasn't taught the things of God. It says it right there. Verse 8, And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. After three times, you'd think he would have gotten it right the first time. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel, and answered, Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. And of course, the Lord went on to tell Samuel some things that Eli was going to die and some other things were going to happen. Pretty, pretty steep things for a young man to hear. But he hadn't been trained. God spoke to Samuel in his own language. He didn't say some foreign name. He said, Samuel, Samuel. So this proves that God speaks in, in our own language. For the boy at first mistook God's voice for that of the aged priest Eli. Sometimes God spoke through angels. Let's turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. If you're with me, give me a high five or an amen or something. <laughs> Luke chapter 1. And this is the story how an angel was sent from heaven to tell Mary she would give birth to Messiah. Luke chapter 1, and we're going to start with verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, espoused, betrothed, contracted, married, but not come together yet, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail! In other words, Hello! Thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. I don't know about you, but if an angel came and said that to me, I'd be a little bit nervous. Look what she said. And when she saw him, she troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. Like, what's going on here? This angel's talking to me. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be? seeing I know not a man. In other words, she'd never come together with Joseph. She'd never had sexual relationship. How is this going to happen? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. The power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. I want you to notice the Trinity's right there. The Holy Spirit's there. The power of the highest was Father God. And Jesus will be the one born. The Trinity is right there together. Verse 36. I just threw that in for a little extra nugget. 
And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. This is a sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. See, the angel spoke in words. He didn't communicate from brain to brain. He spoke out loud to Mary. Other occasions, other than that one, the Lord spoke directly to man. Let's talk about the flood. Let's go into the book of Genesis. This is what God spoke to Noah. Genesis, we'll go into chapter 6. We're speaking right now on how does God speak to us. Genesis chapter 6. And we're going to start with verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Here's a little nugget. Jesus said he was going to come back, and it would be like as the days of Noah. And I tell you, the evil that's in our earth right now is just like it was back then. Homosexuality back then was rampant. Everything evil, filled with violence. Verse 12, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. 13 says, and God said unto Noah, God speaking to Noah, one on one. He didn't write him a letter, he spoke to him. He told him, you make, uh, make an ark of gopher wood. Room shall thou make in the ark, shall pitch it within, and without with pitch, that's slime. And this is the fashion which thou shall make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, the height of it 30 cubits. That's about 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet tall. It's pretty big, about the size of a football field, if I'm not mistaken. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. So the door's on the side. When you see an ark with a door in the front, that does not portray what God said. 17, and behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. How much flesh? All. Let's say all. All, all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. So everything that had the breath in it was going to be destroyed from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant. Thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy son's wife is with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. And, by good, and I'm just going to make a statement about that. You can't reproduce if there's two women together or two men together, it says male and female. And why did he take two so they could reproduce? It's 20 of fowls after their kind and of cattle after their kind and of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come in unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that's eaten. Thou shalt gather it to thee and it shall be for food for thee and for that. So God spoke to Noah and gave him very specific instructions. So, and it took him a long time to build it, about 120 years. One of God's methods of scripture or communication is to reveal his message through dreams and visions. The wise men were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. 
They come to see the king of kings they'd heard about being born because they saw the star. And in Matthew 2, 12, it tells us there, while Peter was later instructed in a vision to minister to Cornelius. Let's turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And we will read, starting with verse 10. Well, let's go to verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance, which is an open vision, by the way. And he saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending upon him. As he, excuse me, as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. He heard that voice say, and he said, No, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spoke unto him again, the second time, What God hath cleansed, thou call that call not thou common. This was done three times and the vessel was received up again into heaven. So God spoke to Peter right there. God communicates in many ways. He revealed himself to Moses from a burning bush. There he is on the backside of the desert and the bush is on fire, but it's not being burned up and he spoke to him. That's in Exodus three and four. And he spoke to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam out of a cloud. Turn to Numbers chapter 12. All of this will be in your, your notes later. You'll be getting a copy of this. Numbers chapter 12. And we'll read verse 5. Excuse me, read verse 4 and 5. Numbers 12, 4 and 5. And the Lord spoke suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron, and unto Miriam. Come out, you three, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. Mm. My servant is not so. Who is faithful in all mine house? With him will I speak, mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my service, Moses? I tell you, you better be careful when you come against somebody that knows God and speak against them. Because Miriam and Aaron were going to be destroyed. But God spoke to them both. Who do you think you are coming against Moses? Prophets may hear something, but I speak to him mouth to mouth, face to face. Wow, don't we all want that? One of the most important ways that divine truths were given in the Old Testament was through the angel of the Lord. Most Bible students perceive that this heavenly messenger was the pre-incarnate Christ himself. For example, it's the angel of the Lord who reassured Joshua on the eve of battle. Turn to Joshua, Joshua chapter five. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Joshua. Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. And we're going to go into chapter five. Right after Deuteronomy. Joshua chapter 5. And we're going to start with verse 13. <clears throat> and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said, 
Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but as the captain of the host of the Lord, I'm now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did. Wherever God is, it's holy. And the presence of the Lord is holiness. Now, how did God's word come to us? That's a good question. The word inspiration is only found once in the New Testament. And that means theophanuestos. T-H-E-O-P-N-E-U-S-T-O-S. Theosto nuestos. It's only found once in the New Testament. And that's in 2 Timothy 3.16, which says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, which literally means God breathed. What did God do with Adam? He made him of the dust and he, he breathed the word into him and he became a living soul. Divine inspiration logically follows divine revelation. In revelation, God speaks to man's ear, but with inspiration, he guides the pen to ensure that the imparted message is correctly written down. Now, there's several ideas about the process of inspiration, which we're going to talk about. They're not all the biblical ones. The first process is called the natural theory. What does that mean? This says that the Bible authors were inspired in the same sense that William Shakespeare or any other writer was inspired. In other words, oh, I got an idea, I'll just write it down. That's called the natural theory. The second theory is called content theory. This suggests that God merely gave the writer the main idea or content, but allowed him to choose his own words to express it. In other words, God gives you an outline and you put it together. In contrast, Jesus himself said that the very letters of the words were also chosen by God. Matthew 5.18 says, For verily, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. In other words, every little exclamation point, every period, every comma, every jot, every tittle. This position referred to is called the plenary verbal view. And what that means is that all plenary, that's what that means, the words, verbal, of the Bible are inspired by God. Jesus once told the devil that the Christian is to live by each of these inspired words. Let's turn to Matthew 4 and 4. Matthew 4, verse 4. Matthew 4 and verse 4. And it says, man, it is written. I mean, now Jesus had been tempted by the devil after not eating for 40 days. He fasted. But he said, he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every word. Every word. The Bible authors understood that their writings were being guided by the Spirit of God even as they wrote them. Peter said that this was true of the Old Testament authors. Now, in 2 Peter, let's turn there. 2 Peter follows 1 Peter. 2 Peter, chapter 1. And we will read verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of, any, is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy 
came not in old time by the will of man, but by holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In other words, all the prophecies in the Bible were not man-made. God spoke it and they wrote it down. Finally, Peter pointed out that this was true about Paul's writings. Stay in 2 Peter, go to chapter 3. Now, Paul had spent three years on the backside of the desert alone with Jesus, and he was taught. See, the disciples had three and a half years with Jesus, but Paul also had time alone. And he went to Jerusalem to speak to James, who was Jesus' brother, tell him some of the things they were doing were not right. Now, Peter is acknowledging this fact in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, it says, An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles. Now, what is an epistle? That just means the letters. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, he wrote Hebrews. These are the letters. That's what epistles mean. It says in verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. In other words, they don't understand it. They're fighting against it, as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. So he's saying what Paul wrote would help them, but they don't want to change. Now, the Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. Second Peter chapter 1. Let's read that in verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Praise God. And let's turn to John chapter 16. So who wrote it? The Holy Spirit wrote it as he spoke to men. John chapter 16. Glory. I know there's a lot to take in and you'll get the notes tonight when we're done. John chapter 16 and we'll start with verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. This is Jesus speaking. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Praise God. The Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. And then he says, all things that the Father hath are mine. Excuse me, verse 14. He that glorify, he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. In other words, he and Jesus talk. Jesus will say this, tell him this, and he'll show it unto us. 15. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and show it unto you. So the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit work together, and the Holy Spirit shows us all truth. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know? Amen. So the Holy Spirit, the, water, the Word came to us through inspiration. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. Man is the instrument used by the Holy Spirit to write the Bible. So what are the results of all of this? The infallible word of God. Therefore, the Bible is free from error and absolutely trustworthy. Turn to Psalms 119. Psalm 119. I tell you, the Psalm 119 is so full of the word word 
and uses it in so many word, ways. Look at verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. <laughs> Forever thy word is settled in heaven. And Matthew 24, 35 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. They're forever preserved, people. One final thing should be said about inspiration. Plenary verbal, which means all verbal inspiration, does not guarantee the inspiration of any translation, but only the original Hebrew and Greek manuscripts. There's a lot of Bibles out there that aren't putting it out right. One of them I don't like is the New International. I have an awesome New International Study Bible, but it leaves verses out. So be careful. Remember, plenary verbal does not guarantee the inspiration of all translations. There's a man named Karabaugh he has a place in Texas called the Creation Science Museum. And they've done great studies. And they've taken sound to determine things. And they put it in a chamber. And when they speak different languages, the sound moves. But when they speak Hebrew into it, it jumps. God's word in the original language is rich. God bless you.